Hey, welcome to Wine Talks with Paul Kay, and we are in studio as well as in Paris today. Wine Talks is available on Google Play, Apple Play, iTunes, you name it, Pandora, iHeartRadio, wherever you hang out for podcasting, we are there. Always sponsored by the original Wine of the Month Club, now touting the Bordeaux, Napa, and Sweet Wine Series. And the reason I say we're going to be broadcasting from Paris, which I'd rather be there doing it myself, but we have in... I can't even say in studio. We have with us today, Mr. Mark Williamson of Willie's Wine Bar. And if you don't know Willie's Wine Bar, it is one of the iconic places to to, to eat and to drink and to taste in the, what is it, the ninth uh, arrondissement? First arrondissement, Paul. Le premier. Oh, the premier. Oh, the premier. Le premier. Palais Royal. Ah, why did I think that? Oh, wow. No, so, we, you know. <laughs> it's pretty easy to do. You know, there's, uh, so this is Mark Williamson. He is the proprietor of Willie's Wine Bar. And, you know, there's so much history to talk about and there's so much to do. But I want to just give the lay of the land for the listeners on Paris itself. There's 18 districts? Uh, 20. Oh, yeah. See, boy, it's 20, 20, 20 island small, and they, they work like a escargot. Um, start in the middle, which is where I am, and then they go round and round in eccentric circles, getting you know further and further out. Um, uh, oh, so, and they're pretty um, small. So the first, the first uh, district, arrondissement, uh, is what are the historic things that people should know about that would set it apart from the rest? Because they all seem to have their own personality. Um, well. Uh, the first arrondissement has got an awful lot of things in it. I'm um, starting with the Ile de la Cité um, and Châtelet. Um, but over this way, we've got the Opera. Uh, we've got um, the Jardin du Palais Royal. We've got the Louvre. We've got the Tuileries. Uh, we've got um, the, the, the Conseil Constitutionnel. We've got the Bourse de Commerce. Um, the, the, it's, it's full of um, sort of... Uh, monuments um, that, you know, very important is the Place de Victoire, which is just down the road. Across the road here, is, which is under, undergoing a, what looks to be an eight-year transformation, is the National Library. Wow. Or, as I call it, the Big Nut. Um, so, uh, it's, there you can, it's very difficult to get away from um, uh, landmarks. You've got the Place Vendôme, you know, where all the jewelers are. Um, there's there's an incredible amount of stuff right here. This is, I mean, it, it, the center of the world. And in the book that we've just written, there is actually a map that proves it. You know, that's interesting because uh, um, I'm, I'm reading a book now, and I'll we'll talk about it in a second, called The Last uh, the Hotel at Place Vendôme. It's about the war years and how the Ritz had participated in yeah. much of yeah. the occupation. Yeah. And so I was, that's what maybe led me to this question as to the districts and how they were formed and, you know, what the purpose of that was. Um, it, it just seemed it, it's so functional. And my daughter worked in the 17th district when she was working for Alain de Casse. And, uh, you know, it, it makes, it gives the lay of the land of what's happening out there. So, I, yeah, it does work really well, and it, it, but it, it, it's it's you. And once you've taken it on board and looked at a little map and seen how the arrondissements work, um, because there's so many landmarks all through the city, and there's a river running through the middle, and you've got the Eiffel Tower, and you've got you know the Arc de Triomphe, and you've got Montmartre, and I mean we could go on and on and on. Um, Notre Dame, what's left of it? Um, you 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 very easily get your you know your your bearings um and i think that uh if you go all the way back to when paris was um Lutes, um then you know the, the the origins of paris are sort of down there um in the, around the Ile saint louis and in the fifth hour and small and the, you know the city walls and things that were much when it was all much smaller and i can't give you a complete history lesson on it, because I'm not very good at history. <laughs> um, but, uh, but basically, I mean, you, the, 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 the old, the very, the, the historical part of Paris, um, you know, is, is the central arrondissements um, that, you know, are the, the first, the second, the third, the fourth, the fifth, the sixth, um, and etc. 
So this is interesting because uh, we'll, I think we'll talk about it now. It, it's going to be part. It was part of the conversation, like, like where you know, how did you choose that space for for Willie's and et cetera, et cetera. But uh, now that I'm reading this book, and I, I consider myself sort of a Francophile, I've been studying French for like five years. My father speaks French, and so we. In fact, I was supposed to have a lesson this morning. But I, I just couldn't get, I just couldn't get here in time, <laughs> and she's actually in in Chartres. She's just outside of Paris, there, uh, where this teacher yeah, resides. Really, really close, like sort of 40, 50 minutes on a train. Yeah, so she's a, she's a wonderful. Um, but there's something romantic about Paris. Always, always has been. But when I'm reading this book. Uh, that I was talking about is it, it, it starts with the Belle Epoque and it talks about uh, you know the Picassos and the Dollies and that era and that generation of artists yeah. and and yeah. and uh, in Paris and then it moves into the Hemingway eras where there was just so much romance uh, to the city. It, you is it feel that way now? I mean, does it still feel magical when you're there? I mean, we always feel magical. We're tourists. But uh, I'm wondering from the resident how it feels the changes. Yeah. In in all honesty, Paris is is kind of sometimes looks like a bit of a mess. It's turned upside <laughs> down. Um, there, there's always always work everywhere. Um, it's very difficult to get around sometimes. Um, and uh, you you sometimes rub your head and sort of say, "What's the point of all this mess?" In yes. this? <laughs> and, and and basically, the mayor um, who's just been re-elected. Um, which basically means that we will, when we get to the end of this, there will have been a, 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 almost a 20-year period of the same ideas and the same people working on the city. So the, the, the infrastructure, the layout and things have, have been profoundly changed. And what um, she wants to do is get rid of cars in the centre of town um, and uh, uh, have uh, uh, sort of community spaces and 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 have Paris work for everybody, not just for the rich Parisians. Um, the, the, the way of going about it seems to me sometimes to be extremely um, uh, out of touch with what you know Paris really needs to be a, a, a vibrant um, sort of and relevant city. Um, and, you know, people at the moment, Paris is emptying, partly because of COVID um, and partly because people, people have kind of gone, um, you know, well, it's, it's you know, they're, they're places where it's, 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 you know, we can go and live that, and not have to put up with all this nonsense. Um, so there, there is, uh, there is a, you know, um, uh, it's work in progress. Um, it'll all get better um, uh, very quickly because of the Olympic Games in three years' time, three, four years' time. Um, and, they, you know, then they'll obviously have to pull everything together and, you know, make it so that um, people can come en masse and enjoy themselves and feel that they're, um, you know, doing the right thing, being in Paris at, at, a, at a sort of historical moment in time. She, she was elected, I think, when we were there last uh, She's this only is, been the mayor for a few years, uh, right? Yeah, this is her second term. Does which she has to deal with the Gilets Jaunes and those group, that group? No, that's 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 the um, the Gilets Jaunes. She uh, yeah, she has to deal with that for uh, up to a point. But um, it's uh, it, it actually the Gilets Jaunes is it's, it's um it's not aiming at any Hidalgo. They're they're they're, they're against Macron. They're against his politics. Right. And so it's, that's a national movement. The Gilets Jaunes is not just in Paris. Right. But they've yeah. kind of. We're over the gilet jaune. I mean, <laughs> that is maybe a good piece of news I can share with you. I mean, it's like the fires in California, I hope to goodness you've got, got them under control. The gilet jaune um, have kind of been and gone for the minute, and I'm sure something else will replace them because we love that kind of stuff here. Yeah. But um, for the moment, au revoir, les gilet jaune. Well, so, <laughs> well, it, <I'll> tell, <laughs> they did make for good uh, French lesson study. So at least it was a conversation that I could have and I could read about. <laughs> and, you know, actually, I, I have to tell you that studying French for the last few years, I've learned much about the French history. So I was able to study about Napoleon and Josephina and, and uh, the Hemingway eras. And it's been really fascinating to uh, things I should have learned in school, right? Uh, things yeah, I should have yeah. studied in school, world history. Uh, in fact, I, was, I have the, the author of... Uh, the, the hotel in Place Vendôme coming on the show. And what I wanted to talk to her about briefly was 
the idea that if, if we're reading in the history books, we read these paragraphs or two or three of maybe the major events in the world, in world history, like the occupation of Paris uh, and the liberation of Paris. But it doesn't really mean that much until you get into the nitty gritty and understand the details of it that you realize this was a, some serious, okay. a serious period. Uh, don't go there. I mean, it's, it really is. It's unending. There's, yeah. uh, talking, you keep mentioning Hemingway. There's, he's, he's got um, uh, 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 a niece or a granddaughter who lives here um, who's, who's very active on Instagram. Um, she's called uh, um, uh, um, Pauline or um, she's, uh, um, she calls herself Le Blonde Rouge. Um, Blanc Rouge. <laughs> Le, Le Blonde Rouge. Oh, and she, she is completely into Parisian history. history. And I mean, you would love it. You, uh, I'll send you the, the I'll, I'll connect you to her on, um, on Instagram. For because sure. I'm always I'd love to do that. Claudine. She's Claudine. Is that Claudine. She's Claudine, Claudine Hemingway and she does tours and things. And she's, she's, she's amazing. Phenomenal. So let's let's yeah. get to the real subject because Willie's. In fact, this morning I have to say I got up. And this is we're nine hours apart or eight hours apart, so my time was probably like six thirty in the morning, and I'm trying to order a copy of the Immovable Feast on Amazon, yes. and it's not available yet. Yeah. And I'm thinking it's yeah. another great study for my French lessons. But uh, 1980, you opened in 1980. Say, say, see, Immovable Feast. Oh, there it is. So you have a copy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> We, we've got it. well. Last last night we we, we had we had the um, the book signing. Yes, we had a go. It was great. I mean, because we had to sit everybody down because you've got social distancing and uh, yeah, you know. So everybody it wasn't like a normal kind of book signing where people wander around, chat with each other. We had everybody sitting and we just went round and sat with them and and you know signed books and and then of course we had a little dinner after which which was great. Um, that is so. But, that is you know, in today's context, you know, with all the things that we, that we have going on that make life impossible, it was such a relief to have, you know, a really nice evening um, with people, and they were all very enthusiastic and positive about it. It was terrific. It almost felt normal, huh? It, uh, yeah, it did. I mean, it did. There was, you know, a, buzz, a spaced buzz around the whole place. Everybody had to are, are masks, are masks exactly. required right now in Paris? Are masks? Uh, yeah, 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 absolutely. Um, masks are required uh, everywhere. Um, in a restaurant, if you're moving around, you have to wear a mask. On the street, you have to wear a mask. In the metro, you have to wear a mask. In any public building, you have to wear a mask. Shopping, you, know, you do it. Masks are literally everywhere. So let's go back to 1980, uh, a young Mark Williamson, and, and I think I sent you year, uh, last year, two years ago, <laughs> Uh, a copy of uh, um, a menu that, that you had signed and my father had brought back. So that was around 87. And I was thinking, gee, he's only, he was, wasn't open that long by the time we went there. But in 1980, you had this idea. You thought that you a good idea to open a wine bar, which according to what I've read about was probably a pretty progressive thing to do in, in Paris at the time. Can you tell me about that sort of realization that this was a good idea? It, it, it started out, with um, me sort of finishing, coming out of school and um, not having a great deal to do and people sort of say, well, what are you, what are you going to do? And I sort of said, I, you know, I'm going to open a restaurant. Um, mm -hmm. And I had this really great conversation with my uncle, who was a complete Francophile. Um, and in his garden one Sunday with a bottle of rosé, I see you would mention rosé. He was into rosé even then. Um, and it was lovely summer's day and we had this great conversation. We got stuff to talk about. He said, well, I'm going to Paris next week. Why don't you come with me and we'll go and see some people. And um, he stayed at the Lancaster Hotel and knew the um, general manager there. And so we had a meeting with the general manager and he said to me, you've got to go and learn how to cook before you do anything else. Um, and so you're French, you don't have any French. I was a bit like you, don't have any French. Go to the Connaught Hotel in London and work there. And when you've got some cooking experience, come and see me again. And so I went to the Connaught Hotel and I worked there in various places around the kitchen. You know, the garmanger wow. and the pizzerie and the you know the entremet and the grillade and the rotisserie and you know and did all these things. Um, and um, and two years later, I came back and said, "Right, I've done that. Um, what's next?" 
Um, and <laughs> he sent me down to Roussillon. I still didn't speak any French. He sent me down to Roussillon, which is um, in the Vaucluse, um, uh, right next to Apt and, and uh, outside Avignon, for anybody who sort of knows the yes. general. Um, and I stayed there for six months, um, and, uh, and I, it was a bit limiting, but we won't get into all of that. So I came up to Paris, um, and I sort of, by then I was speaking a bit of French and thought I could win an argument, which is, for me is very important. That's the part of, yeah, that's part of French uh, studies. Yeah, and so, I, <laughs> um, and so I, I, I sort of kicked off in Paris, and I worked in various restaurants, and I mean, basically spent um, uh, the better part of um, another two years cooking. So six months back in Provence, 18 months in Paris. Um, and then I said, well, right, that's four years of cooking. That, that surely is enough. Um, and uh, time to do something with wine. And, and I went off and did the harvest in 76 uh, at a place called Romage la Batise, which is up the hill from Mouton Rothschild in saint Sauveur in the Medoc. Um, and then I came back and I met Stephen Sperrier, um, who had his wine shop and the Academy du Vin. And I said, Stephen, look, you know, this is what I want to do. And he's, we came to a deal where he, I worked in the wine shop and did the deliveries and stuff like that. And in the evening, I went to the Academy de Bain, and that was absolutely fine. And then when he went traveling uh, in the vineyard, that's when he took me with him. And I went, I went you know, off to round France on my own, and sometimes with Stephen, um, and uh, got sort of, you know, a basic... Um, knowledge, working knowledge of, of wine and how all those things went and that. So that, that went on for three years. And then um, I saw no point in going back to Britain, which is what I had originally thought I was going to do. Um, my plan was to open some, you know, open a little bistro in, in somewhere in England. I don't know where, but it wasn't, that was, you know, but my, my thought process evolved and I, I saw the enthusiasm that the French had for food and wine um, and there were so many things here that I bought into, as well as the proximity of good ingredients. And that really appealed to me. Um, and the markets, and, you know, there were all these things. And it was just such a vibrant place um, compared to Britain at that time. I and mean, it was a few years before Sally Clark um, opened in, in London. It was a few years before a few other people um, launched. And, went, you know, the, the movement got going. I was just one of those people who decided to, not to sort of launched myself in Britain because I just didn't see the, the you know, the love for um, bistros in, in the, on the same level as I did here. And I thought nothing about the, the problems of launching in France and being a foreigner and, yeah, you know, not an issue. <laughs> meddling and things that didn't concern me. I just, you know, when you, when you have an idea and you're that young, you just kind of go, you know, I can do it, um, which is why I did. Well, it's interesting because, uh, you know, Stephen's story, he'll himself admit they were sort of an aristocratic uh, Brit came to, you know, the, I, I always asked him, I said, do you feel like there's a risk to this idea of coming to Paris and opening? So he's not, nah, we, you know, we were, we were supported by our family on both sides. We had no issues. Uh, Melvin Masters, our good friend, is had a different story. You know, he was not quite as aristocratic and he was sort of bootstrapping everything and, and, and had issues with all that. In your case... Uh, you know, opening a restaurant is always a risk in uh, anywhere. I don't if even worse today, but I would imagine in 1980, it's just as difficult uh, to try and make a dollar doing this. It was, it, 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 um, I, oh, I spent a long time not making any money. Don't worry. <laughs> yes. I mean, even today, especially COVID and things, I mean, it's, it, you, don't, you don't get rich all the time. Um, there are moments when, you know, things go remarkably well. Um, you know, there's sweet spots, but France is one of those places that, that, you know, the sweet spots are basically few and far between. And then the, the sort of problem areas, um, uh, it come quickly and go and, and sort of go slowly. Um, and what happened when I opened here was, um, I got off to a reasonable start and everybody was very supportive. Bit, everybody, you know, the locals, it was a local clientele and they were, they were delightful and, and, and I think thought it was pretty funny. Um, and, and, and there were other people like Stephen who were incredibly supportive. And so I, I got, you know, I got a bit of press here and there and, um, and I, I was sort of one, one of the new and, and exciting things, um, in town, which is great. Um, and, and then of course, um, the whole world changed because Valérie Giscard d'Estaing, um, who was the French president at the time, lost the presidential election in, uh, so I opened in October, 1980. In May 1981, 
Giscard um, very clumsily manages to lose the election. And we got uh, Francois Mitterrand, who linked up with the communists, scared everybody rigid. Um, wow. and, and half the international clientele just left. You know, the, the, and, and business kind of collapsed um, on, on a grand scale, you know, Paris empty. But Mitterrand added a big luxury tax to luxury restaurants. And I was on the other end of the scale completely. Wow. Well, I became incredibly fashionable. People were coming in and going, you know, I have to introduce you to my new little discovery. Um, and the, the only reason they wanted to come was because it was inexpensive and they weren't going to pay a 33% tax on having lunch in my restaurant. Wow. Um, or in my wine bar. I mean, so that, that was, Mitterrand, I mean, much as I don't agree with very many things that he did, um, was... Uh, in, in, in a funny way, um, instrumental in, in me being launched in a more durable manner. Well, oh, that's amazing. That's amazing that politics, I wouldn't doubt that America is faced with sort of the same criteria right now, that there could be a big change uh, in how business is done, depending on the result of the election. I won't get into yeah, politics. If they, don't, if they don't pick the right poster to have, you know, in the That's interview. right. <laughs> <laughs> that could be a serious problem. <laughs> problem. I want to ask you a question because it's kind of, it's, it's interesting to me and I've been following, I've been studying um, the French cuisine of the, of the Andre Soltners and the Henri Soleils of New York and, and that whole old cuisine uh, era. And uh, let's face it, I mean, not to be insulting, but, you know, the Brits weren't necessarily known for their food at that time, probably. Uh, but uh, then I then I have had, I've had Joachim Slichal here on the show, and he's from sort of the Nouvelle Cuisine of the Nice. Joachim Slichal, he's, he came from Nice originally. He was trained in Nice. And uh, James Beard award-winning type chef. I've had Ken Frank. And so... He, one thing that copy is interesting because they had this, this the haute cuisine, the traditional Escoffier of French cuisine and the five mother sauces and everything, you know, works off of that. And then we have this Nouvelle cuisine, which was, you know, it doesn't, it's not Nouvelle around. It really isn't Nouvelle because there's nothing new about using fresh ingredients and, and fresh twists, but that's, that's the name of it. What were you thinking to do? Were you looking at the Boucou's? Style things and and the uh, the trois gros and the and the no, 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 no. type food. Or are we looking at something totally new? No, not at all. Not at all. I mean, our, our cuisine has always been um, sort of light and fresh and simple and 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 um, seasonal. Um, uh, there's uh, the, when um, Nouvelle Cuisine came around. It was uh, I mean, it was seventy five, seventy six. Um, it, it really was, it was maybe 78, you know, Gomio and all of that. And I mean, France has been through many sort of evolutions since then. Um, and the, um, but Willie's has always been uh, sort of, I would say, um, fairly simple bistro cooking um, with a light edge. So, you know, we've always had vegetarian things. We've always been extremely seasonal um, and we've always had fresh stuff and you know quality stuff so, um poultry and stuff has always come from um supplier down in the loire valley um and game and things come from people in lorraine and you know so we it, it all kind of um is 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 pretty much um a, you know a yearly thing um and you know what we for example we've just moved on to we'll be moving on to saint jacques you know scallops um now and we've we've, we've got um uh, just started um wild wow. hair um wow. hair yeah things like that um and so you know so it's 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 simple it's small menu very small menu um and um uh, and and wholesome um and affordable um, so not at all um, high-end three-star restaurant. So the so here is 1980. You started the restaurant. We've uh, we, we you know in our notes our, our prior notes here. We're, we're talking about some things about the tourist the tourist. But my father went in 1987. Why would he go to Willie's Wine Bar in 1987? In other words, when did it become sort of this? Well, have you heard about Willie's? Have you been to Willie's? Uh, and we'll talk about how you named it in a second, but 
was there a time where you realized, gee, this is sort of a destination as well as a local bistro? Uh, that was a very slow process. Um, uh, I mean, there were, there were little bits and pieces that appeared um, uh, in, you know, tiny little things in, in sort of newspapers like, you know, um, the International Herald Tribune and the New York Times and things like that, little spots here, and um, wonderful travel magazines and, and bits and pieces, but, you know, things that people would go, oh, when I'm next in town, you know, cut it out and put it in a little corner, um, because that's how people did stuff in those days. Um, uh, but it was, it, it, you know, we, we started out as a neighborhood bistro, um, and I think one of the things that drew foreigners to us or tourists to us um, was this kind of, um, especially Australian, English speaking, American, Canadian, British, etc. was that, that, that we, we did, they could walk in and feel at home because we actually could speak them in a language they understood. Um, and at, at the time, there were a lot of places in Paris that where people, um, you know, hospitality staff did not speak English. Um, they didn't think they had to, that wasn't what they did. Um, and uh, so, I mean, we really, we had a little USP on that level, which brought, um, I guess, a certain number of people in there. They liked the place, they liked us, and they loved the fact they could speak to us. Well, it's sort of kind of Mr. Spurrier's attempt, right? I mean, here, his whole idea was uh, attract the English-speaking business people from IBM and the Americans and the, and the Brits that were in the neighborhood of L'Academie. Yeah, well, the, that was very much where he was at the Madeleine. I mean, that there was, uh, he, he also, I mean, he had a very high-end French clientele too because, you know, Hermès, the, 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 the um, famous um, shop was, was round the corner from the Cap de Madeleine. And, the, and there were many, many other things that, that, that sort of drew in clients. But IBM were, were wonderful supporters of the Academy du Vin. I mean, virtually nobody who was anybody at IBM um, would, you know, um, think of not attending a uh, one of the wine courses at the Academy. Um, and uh, there was the British Embassy, the American Embassy, um, and, you know, just so many things that were um, dovetailed into the Carpe de Madeleine and the Academy de Vin. Whereas here, I deliberately made a, an effort to um, not make a play of being English, not make a play of being British, not make it. I didn't want my wine bar to be thought of as a tea room. I wanted it to be. I didn't want it to be seen as a British place or an English place. I wanted it to be seen as a wine place. And so, I mean, I never. I, I had appalling French. I mean, I had an appalling French accent. I still do. <laughs> well, <laughs> I, I still play it up. But I, I, I didn't. It was there was never any flag waving, you know. And 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 um, uh, it's it, it's. Uh, I, I didn't want it to be seen as a pub. I didn't want it to be seen as a tea room. Um, oh, well, which that's... so, so a, a kind of those were the cliches of the, you know of the yes. cliches of the time. Yeah. Well, I will say my dad uh, came from uh, Cairo in 1949, and and I didn't know him then, obviously, but he had a very heavy British accent, and and I don't know if he made an attempt to make sure it's American. You wouldn't know that today, but he but he also had, was forced not forced. He he learned French in school is because, and I was noticing actually something very interesting. We were watching a movie which was about the Armenians that came to Cairo uh, after the first uh, genocide attempt and. Uh, this this movie happened to be placed in the 30s, and most of the street signs and business signs were not in English and Arabic. They were in Arabic and French. And I thought, well, right. what an unusual accent that guy must have had, right? He spoke Arabic, Turkish, Armenian, French, and English. So that's so <laughs> we all have yeah. appalling French accents. I don't know if you can have a real French accent without really, you know, having grown there. But um, so in 1980s. Yeah, and then they're all all the French accents are different anyway. I mean, you know, they're, 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 a Corsican accent is nothing like an accent from Touraine uh, or from Alsace. You they're know, they're from all south. They're, they're, and exactly Provençal. I mean, you know, they've all they've all got these. And south southwest and south est don't have the same accent. Okay, so wait, there's. I just, it reminds me of a conversation I had with uh, Guy Rivoire of Bollinger. Bonjour, I guess. Um, and he was talking about the purest French accent was a, from the north. And I have to play that back. He cites the village where they where it's considered the authentic French accent. Ah, uh, um, it's it's meant to be. I mean, if you Tours? It depends. Tour, yeah, yeah. 
tour. Yeah, it's it's in the that's in the center in the, in the Loire Valley. Yeah, it's where Chinon comes from. Chinon, Chinon, Beauvais, are beautiful. Um, tour. It's it's it's. Uh, if you go from Chartres and you keep going down down the Loire, you get to Tour. It's it's not that far either. The um, so your fascination, it looks like based on what I was reading, was was with the Rhone varietals, the Rhone wines uh, when you came to to start Willie's. And of course, we have to figure out you know how you named the bar because I read that yesterday, the October thirteenth, was the anniversary of the name E. Is that correct? Uh, it, it, it was the, uh, the anniversary of the wine bar. Yeah, well, no. I mean, uh, I don't know. You did. I read something. October thirteenth was that the anniversary of the wine bar? It's the anniversary of the wine okay. bar. Okay, yeah. and then so the Willie the, the dog. That's when. That's why we had the party and the signing. That's right. Okay, yeah. And so well, not the, a party. It wasn't a party, but but a fortieth um, birthday party. That's amazing. You know, 40 years. Actually, that's another point I want to make. But how did you name Willie's, just so since I'm on the subject? Um, I was going to call it McCready's because that's my middle name. And a, a, a wonderful Frenchman that I knew who was kind of um, looking on came rushing in when we were kind of plastering and painting and things and said, Mark, you know, what are you going to call this place? And I said, ah, oh, McCready's. And he said, mate, don't you realize that in French that sounds like McCready? which is credit, yes. you can't possibly call it. You must call it something nice and simple, like really. Um, and I said, okay, I'll call it Willie. <laughs> Come on, seriously. Um, and uh, and, uh, and uh, there's Monsieur Willie, um, who was Colette's first husband. Um, and Colette lived just across the road at the back here. So, I mean, it, it, it did, did make sense. Um, but I really wasn't too fussed about what That's it was so called. funny. No, um, it, it's uh, which which is kind of extraordinary. Um, you know, but there's a picture of the dog. I was reading in the web, and there's like this. It's it oh, read yes. like the uh, Jaja. Uh, uh, Jaja. No, no, the thing about the dog is everybody used to come in and go, uh, "Hello, are you Willie?" And oh. I, <laughs> I go, "No, hi, I'm, I'm Mark. Who yes. are you? How do you do? <laughs> I'm very nice to meet you." That's and then funny. they go. You know, make here Willie, and I go, oh, well, Willie's the dog. Um, and this went on for years and years and years and years and years. And eventually, I turned to Arabella, who's the one who worked with me on the book, and I said to her, you know what, we need a dog. And she went, oh. And then we did various drawings of dogs, and we finally settled on uh, a dog that we thought was absolutely right, and that's the dog that you see here and there and uh -huh. Okay, so now it's tied together. Yeah, yeah it's exactly. an impression. So, I mean, it, it's, it's really, it's just, it's, it's a shaggy dog story. Yeah. So, and there's plenty, <laughs> sorry. Of, there's plenty of that in the book. There's, well, that's the next question is about the book because, well, first I want to get to this 40-year tenure because uh, my wife's cousin has a restaurant here in Pasadena that's got 30 years, which is unheard of in California, really. Uh, yeah. The great uh, restaurants uh, in downtown LA and LA being really the hotbed of Nouvelle cuisine in the 70s and 80s is being part of the movement in America for 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 food. Um, but I have a book on my coffee table at home. I, I absconded it from my mother. Uh, she had that book. She also had a Scoffier's, a, a 1962 version of a Scoffier's cookbook, which I wow. used. And but this book is called The Great Chefs of France. It was written about 75 or 78. And it talks about the Toigros and the Bucuses and, 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 uh, yes. uh for, the for now, yeah, the whole yeah. thing. And, and if, so I took that book, I took the book and when we went to France last, I think it was two years ago, I was going to do on this, you know, voyage gastronomique, right? We're going to, we're going to hit these places and we're going to experience these legendary restaurants, Willie's included, of course. And, but what I found, which was fascinating to me, was that most of them were still open. Most of them still part of the Michelin Etoile system. Most of them still part of the family. Uh, you know, go to Gourouin and you go to Traguo and you can go to CRC, PRRC in Lyon and go see the uh, Paul Bocuse at the time. And that doesn't happen here. I mean, very rarely. Uh, even the great French restaurants of New York uh, don't exist anymore. So... To last 40 years, whether it's a bistro or a 
fine dining restaurant is pretty phenomenal. What, how do you how do you reconcile I mean, that? I think, I think there are places. I mean, I think that, that France is probably a little bit like the States, but things do tend to last probably more. Um, but, you know, places like uh, in New York, Daniel Boulud, isn't he still there? Yep. Yeah, he's Boulud? still there, yeah. Uh, I mean, he's been going for a while. That's um, true. And, and, I mean, I, I'm, I'm sure Wolfgang Park um, in, in, in uh, L.A., he, or isn't that? It's he's, still LA. Around, he's still around, Wolfgang, that's true. Wolfgang's kicking it. I mean, you know, and showing everybody. And my friend Jonathan Waxman, I mean, admittedly, he, he's had restaurant after restaurant after restaurant, but um, Barbuto, which has moved, I think, um, uh, uh, that's still there. Um, you know, it may have morphed, but it's, it's still there. In France, um, I think people, people are less uh, driven by this kind of need to have the next great thing. They find somewhere that they like, and if they like it, they're going to they, they adopt it. And French people use their restaurants very much um, in, in a European sense too, because I mean, you know, the Spanish, the Italians also do this. And they, I mean, it, Italy is the most amazing place for restaurants that you think. I mean, what's this place doing here? And, it, and it's just cranking on. You know? And um, so it, Italy is a far sort of more poignant example of this. But in France, people treat restaurants, uh, particularly on a bistro level, um, very much as an extension of their own home. Um, so you, you, they dine out a lot, um, but in a very casual manner. Um, and, you know, you, you will see the same people coming year after year, you know, maybe once a week, maybe once a month, you know, maybe three times a year. But, you know, they... they they have an address that they like, and they, they sort of go, keep going, yeah. Very and then well. if, they have, if they have a bad experience, you know, then maybe, you know, they won't go anymore. Yes, so, of course. Um, and, then, and then, of course, you, do, you tend to renew your, your, your things. And France, Paris now, has, has a huge number of new restaurants. I mean, a huge number. And this, and this COVID thing is only going to accelerate that. Really? Um, but for sure, for sure. But, I mean, you know, I think, you know, we might be able to get another decade out of this without, you know, if we're lucky. You know, it's funny. Uh, when, when Mel was in here, we were talking, and I was playing it back to see how it sounded and just listening. And he mentions uh, the book Chefs, Drugs, and Rock and Roll. And yes. Mel mentions, I got to read it. And so I read the book, and it talks about Jonathan Waxman and that whole movement, right? And then yes. one of the chefs he talks about is Ken Frank, who is now up in Napa with Latoque. And so I had him, I had him on the show because I just wanted to hear what he had to say. It's a fascinating uh, fraternity, so to speak, of, of – well, let me put it this way. It's not really a fraternity. It's such a difficult business, and it, it requires camaraderie to yeah, survive. I mean, there's some, some of the American chefs are very much sort of um, not in each other's pockets, but – um, very much, you know, um, in tune with each other, and, and you know, they share their experiences and, and, and ideas and, and difficulties in the past, staff backwards and forwards, um, etc. Um, and I think that's that's one of the really nice things about um, you know the, the chefs that I know in the states. Um, they, you know, and they do well. They do a lot of um, uh, uh, sort of um, charity work together. They're always yeah. raising money. Um, and, and that, I think, helps, you know, having these platforms where they all get together and they all do something together and it's not for them, it's for sort of community good. Um, and that, that is a very big thing in the States, which, which we don't have to the same level in Europe. You know, my daughter, uh, is, she, uh, she went to um, Alanda Costa's pastry school outside of Lyon yeah. in, in East saint yeah. and uh, she ended up baking in Paris for a little bit, and then she came to America, did some odd things, and landed in New York, working for a chef, Jonathan Benno, who was Thomas Keller's right-hand man in many places, open per se for him. And they had just, uh, her name's on the menu, Head Baker, uh, just won their Michelin Etoile, um, I think it was February, and then COVID hits. 
And as we know, as we know, with in the world of food, particularly uh, Europe, you know, the Michelin star is such an important part of it. And it is in America, of course. Uh, it does wonders for your business. It, it establishes credibility. And here, this poor gentleman, you know, just just earned it, and and probably won't reopen in New York because it's gonna, the cycle's so long there right now. How important yeah. are the accolades like that to? Were they to Willie's when you first started, and as the ongoing, you know, attempt in the, the to woo the food food critics of the world? Is this an important feature? Is Willie's just so solid that it's less important? I don't. I mean, I think it would be very foolish to say Willie's is so solid. Um, uh, it's um, uh, that nowhere. Um, you know, we're all incredibly vulnerable, especially. I mean, especially now. Um, but uh, and we've never really had any alkalates. You know, there's nothing. I, I can't put on one of those collars. Oh, you're moth. You're not a moth. <laughs> um, and I, I mean, you know, I think the, the best we ever got was was what I what I wanted was you know those one of those um, uh, you know forks in the Michelin. Yeah, um, right. Bend, uh, bend them, you know, you know for, for good value. Um, and uh, uh, it's it's important when it. When it's important is when you're starting out um, and you need to kind of get going um, and having um, the guides sort of saying, look at this, it's new, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That is absolutely wonderful because it really does kick you off. And then after that, you, you, it's, you have to kind of keep it going yourself. I think, you know, there are so many star restaurants that, um, you know, have all the problems that everybody else has um, and are very uncomfortable having to live with their stars because they're terrified of losing them. And I took over next door, I took over a restaurant that was one star Michelin, um, Maceo, it's now Maceo, it used to be the Mercure Gunnel. I've had it for a quarter of a century um, and I've got no stars. And we do great food, we, it's a beautiful restaurant, great food, wonderful wine, um, and it's all sort of pretty simple. It's just much more kind of refined than Willie's. Um, and uh, we get on just fine. You know, uh, when we're allowed to, you know, when we're open. Um, yes, <laughs> yeah, well, that would help, right? <laughs> um, and, 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 you know, there's a, there's a, there's a very loyal clientele. And, um, and, and, you know, but, it, but it, it, you, you, you can't go to sleep on it. You have to. It's, 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 it's nothing, nothing at all is, is what the French would call a key. You know, no, there's nothing there that you can keep. I see. It, it can be gone in a, gone in a, in a, in yeah, a blink right. of an eye. Yeah. Well, the restaurant business is like that anyway. I mean, uh, yeah. you know, I was thinking it's funny. We were talking about the Michelin, uh, Michelin Guide, and I, what's that? There's a funny French co comedy uh, movie. Uh, it's not the Michelin, of course. They couldn't use that term, but it's about uh, the two two uh, two uh, ambassadors of that industry, and they're chasing each other down. They're trying to get each other's business away. It's such a funny movie. I forgot the guy's name. I'll have to remember now. Um, but uh, when I tell people that the Michelin Guide had started out of, it, first of all, they always wonder if it's the same as the tire company, which it is, and that the idea behind it in 1929 or 1930 was that we wanted you to use your tires up. And so we want you to drive <laughs> to places outside of Paris yeah. and use up your tires yeah. so you need more tires. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And one of, one of, the, you know, one of the, the star system things, I can't remember which one. I mean, it was either three star or two star, but it was... I think it's three star. It's vol de tour. This 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 place um, is worthy of you deviating from your route to get to. <laughs> yes, you know, that's right. Hundred or two hundred kilometers. Yeah, a um, yeah. couple of sets of tires, and you know we've got more business, right? How just for fun? Uh, what was the? I don't know. I guess it's scuttlebutt. What was the undercurrent, underlying current of of when Bakus lost their three stars and were busted down to two stars? Was this a big deal in France? Um, I think he wasn't the only person who's been through that experience. I mean, it's happened to a number of chefs, um, and I'm not sure that it happened while he was alive. I no, think it was it, after. It was uh, yeah, right after. So yeah. They, I mean, they did the same thing to Fernand Point. Um, uh, and, and it's almost um, out of um, respect for Bocuse and for Fernand Point and maybe for one or two other people that they waited um, 
beyond the time, you know, this is beyond its sell-by date, but we couldn't possibly, yes. because <laughs> this guy's done so much for, um, you know, for the metier, um, so much for all the people who work in, in hospitality, um, in kind of, you know, giving them something to aspire to. And, and he's been a great ambassador for, for France and for French cuisine, and all. you can go on and on and on as to why it would be a very poor thing to kind of go, you know what, uh, you're just not up to it anymore. Yeah. Um, you could do that to, to somebody who's kind of a bit further down the, the, the you know. The, I think um, that was, I think that makes sense. It was a, just a form of respect uh, yes. and weight. Uh, yes. So let's get to the real important stuff. Okay. Uh, the, the, I, I, I cherish my 1987 Willie's Wine Bar poster. I told you the story of Yontville. Wait, I'm listening, I'm listening. And here's it's, the perfect it's timing. I mean, of course, here, here it's 9.37, and, and you, we all know that our palates are best between 9 and 11, so probably yeah, should well, do the same. Uh, mine's, been, mine's been waiting for a drink. For wow, beautiful. Oh. So uh, it seems that your, your posters have become socially iconic. Was this something from the beginning um, that you started this idea? And then how do you arrive at the... Over. And the themes are dramatically different through uh, through history. So, was there a 1980 poster? No. no. What What happened was I was it was one rainy weekend, like you know, a bit like this. Uh, I was in the cellar doing work, sort of building bins and kind of sorting stuff out right at the beginning. You know, it's just doing stuff. And this guy turned up, and his name was Alain Ve, and he was the director of the Musée de Publicité. Mm -hmm. um, and he, we started talking, and he started drinking Muscat at Rome de Venise. And um, I wanted to get back to the cellar, but he was, he was, you know, one of these people that liked sort of spending time at the bar. So it went, this conversation went on and on, and suddenly he said to me, you know what, I've got a poster from Cassandre that's never been published um, at home, and if you want, we could use this for the wine bar, um, and was it, this poster is, is a commercial image. It needs a vehicle, something that it can travel on. Yeah. Um, and and I, I said, great, bring it, let, bring it in, let's show it to me, we'll talk about it, let's do this. And so we did it. It was a very simple sort of kind of um, spontaneous, more or less spontaneous thing. That's a great idea. And out came the poster. And I looked at Anna and I said, this is fantastic. You know what? Um, of course, you know, Pirelli calendars. Of course, you know of Mouton Rothschild. I mean, there were many things he knew far more about art than I did. This is what we're going to do. We're going to do a poster every year. And, um, and he turned up the next year with another very old image that was not nearly as good um, from somebody else. I mean, it was something that he found. And it wasn't really a wine image. And I said, no, no, no I want to. And that was fine. It, it suited the moment, but I'm, I'm, we, we're, we're in the mid '80s, and I want to work with, um, you know, artists of my time. Uh, I want to be, you know, up to date and and and, and uh, relative to mm -hmm. the time in which I'm living. Um, and and so he sort of looked bewildered and confused, but not for long. And he came back with a, a wonderful uh, um, Italian Argentine artist um, called Alberto Bali. And Alberto did this incredible image of bottles dancing. Um, a very, very, very sort of austere little image. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and, and that was the beginning. That was, and then we went on from there. And then eventually there was a disagreement. And, and I then started bringing in artists on my own. Um, or they were coming to me. And, um, and, you know, I just sort of went on and on and on and on and on. Um, so you commissioned, but so now they're commissioned. They're not, I, I, for some reason in my head, I had some idea that was a, uh, a contest, you know, amongst um, uh, uh, patrons, but it sounds like you commission an artist, you find a, do you, do you direct them in, you know, some of the stuff looks art deco. Some of the stuff looks surreal. Do you, do you direct them in the style or they, they, they feel what Willie's wine bars to them produces stuff. What I, what I look for is very much what I look for in wine. <laughs> Um, I like wine that's got um, uh, an identity, a personality, um, and, and is some, something to say for itself. Um, and I think it's very important that for the wine bar, the images have um, uh, something um, to do with the enjoyment of wine. 
Um, and that's about it. You know, uh, I, if, if I can find an artist that likes wine um, and that wants to participate, or if they find me, I sort of say, you know, this is the brief. It's just, it's just about um, enjoyment of wine. You've got to, you're conveying a message. It's not about the wine bar. The wine bar is just the deco. It's about enjoyment of wine so that people um, have an Im imaginary kind of, um, a little, you know, a little refreshing reminder that mm -hmm. maybe takes half a second, um, you know, ab about how nice it is to be with friends and drink wine. Um, so that's well, it. Simple. That's, but they're, they're so much fun. And I encourage uh, listeners and viewers of this to, to just Google it and see how eclectic the mix is and how fun they are. And they all seem to feel something. You know, I mean, here I am peering at somebody's window in Yontville. I'm saying it's so recognizable, even though the styles are different year to year. Uh, and so you have, like even the one you use for the book. Yeah, uh, well, that one that one comes from 1990. It was meant to be 1989 to celebrate the revolution, um, and the artist was having such a good time that he came in a year late, um, and we'd, we'd already moved on and done something else in, in 1989. Um, but it's it's an it's an that, that is a poster that originally Marvin Shankin um, from the Wine Spectator. Yeah. He, he used to carry the posters, and when he saw that, he said, "No," nah. he said, "I can't sell that," um, and. Uh, what? And so I told, I told everybody, I, I said, you know, it's been banned by the wine spectator. Um, which <laughs> only, only, <laughs> and now it's the know. most sought after, isn't it? <laughs> Thank you, Marvin. So it was, uh, I mean, but it's a great poster. It, it really is. is. A great poster. You know, we, we put it on the book because, I mean, it kind of went with this kind of, you know, concurrent, um, you know. Um, yeah, but it's all. It's all you know, over the barricades kind of stuff. In the name of art, of course. Yes, yes, of course. You, you yeah. said something I want to... I can't believe how fast this has gone, but I, I do want to talk about um, this idea you said about wine personality. And you have, like I said, I think I read about your your affair with uh, Chateauneuf de Pop in the Rhone region in the beginning. And my current my current fascination is uh, is Burgundy. I just stocked, uh, just did some research and found some incredible vintages for a client to the tune of like twelve thousand dollars worth of wine for the guy. And brilliant. Uh, Wine, the conversation I try to have, and it's very difficult in today's time with the way the current wine market is. It's changed so dramatically since I was stocking the shelves in the 70s at my dad's store. And that is, there doesn't seem to be, the, the swath of wine that comes from all over the world into America right now at a dollar, a euro, or a, a, euro, a euro, I'm sorry, a euro a liter I mean, they can't have a personality, and if it does, it's you know obscure. But there's a need for, I believe, at this day. Maybe you can agree with me. Maybe you don't. To bring back, and I had this conversation with Stephen. This appreciation, the Academy Devant, let's say, or the Lesimi Devant, which is what my father was involved with, and it's now defunct. And I want to bring it back in California. And I haven't decided, and I'm going to do it. I just haven't decided what it looks like anymore. Is it the same as the old days where we used to hold tastings and dinners? You'd come and taste and swirl and sniff and, and do all the, uh, the the traditional things, or is it more contemporary looking and feeling for the millennials and the yeah, yeah, Xers? Probably definitely needs to be contemporary. And this is, I mean, you know, with, with every, every kind of endeavor you've got to, it's got to be remain relevant. And that's a huge challenge. Always. I think that's the key, right? So Stephen says, you must do this. And now, of course, now, now I have to do it. The boss said, you have to do it. So <laughs> I'm in trouble. But I want to do it because I'm Even facing from the business side of things, which is a, you know, a different approach to any business. See, there's the wonderful esoteric and ethereal part of wine. And, and that's the part that keeps us going, but we want to sell wine. We want to, you know, we want to support our family. So we, we have to sell what we can. And the conversation, um, well, I'm sorry, the consumer is being barraged, barraged, particularly with social networking, with these messaging, like you can get a decent wine on Groupon for four bucks and three bucks and, and $15 for $45. It just goes on and on and on. And they're getting this message every day, five times a day. When you and I have this, this, this value proposition with wine, that it means, it has to mean, it has to feel something. You have to sip it and be taken somewhere. 
by its complexity and its character and its terroir and all those things. And so uh, how is it that, how has that changed or has it changed from the premise of Willie's in 1980 to 2020, or let's go back to 2019 when we actually were open. Um, how has that changed in the consumer side of things? Is, is it just a drinking change or is it their uh, ethereal value of wine change? What, What's happened? If we talk about if we talk about France and we talk about wine consumption in France, I mean, like everywhere else, there have been huge changes. But um, in in 1980, people were basically, you know, it was there was a permit, there was Bordeaux, Burgundy, um, you know, uh, and then everything else under that Loire Valley. Okay, people knew where that was. The Rhone. Okay, um, and you know, a bit of Provence, and, and but it was it was kind of the accent was always on Champagne, Bordeaux, Burgundy. Right. And the reason for that was also because the people were bombarded, not bombarded in the same way, but the, the, the wine professionals, um, you know, and the wine writers and the magazines and things, uh, the, the dollars going in were coming from the big estates um, and the big negotiants, um, etc. And they basically kept everybody else out. What what happened after that was we in in you know in seventy six there was um, the judgment of Paris and that I think was a, a fundamental. Forget about who won and who lost; it didn't doesn't really matter because we moved on. It showed all the people who had been kept um, in the shade and in the darkness and had been suppressed showed them that they too could do what California had done, mm-hmm. and, and so you thought. You saw the the Languedoc waking up. You saw, um, you know, people being far more ambitious um, everywhere, and it's still going on today. You know, there are more and more and more places coming on the online and sort of and paying attention to what they what they have their their indigenous grape varieties. Um, And you know, this is what I think is so so much fun today is that in you know we're not concentrating on imitation high-end Chardonnay or imitation high-end Cabernet yeah. Sauvignon. <laughs> yeah, um, you know, this this tastes like Chateau Margot. Or this. Nobody's interested in that. The young certainly aren't interested in that. They're not interested in point scores. They're interested in um, in discovery and experience and taste and, and oh, it seems to me that way. And then, of course, there's this little deviant of natural wine, which, um, you know, can be amazing, um, yeah. but invariably... Um, is is it's some it's sort of it's a learning curve for me. I'm probably never going to get that. Well, I don't know. Stephen had the same comment. In, in fact, it's interesting because the woman who I'm going to put on the show, this Tilar Mazio, who wrote this book yeah. about Place Vendome, she just closed a winery in British Columbia uh, due to COVID mostly, but in, and she calls it raw wine. And yes. I wrote a little article on LinkedIn about natural wines, at least in America, the concept doesn't exist. Though I think they just started something in France, the Nature Méthode Sans Sulfate, sans, sans, whatever the French word for sulfates is. And it actually defines what, and it's a new emblem, you know, it's more contemporary looking. Uh, what was interesting to me, it, there's only three criteria. One that is organically grown, two that is hand-picked, and, and there's no added sulfites. Okay, so that's, you know, that's some criteria, I guess. Uh, but the organization, after 10 years of debating what this thing should be, is only giving itself three years to prove out that this is a good idea. And I thought, wow, that's not very much time for something as radical as, when I'm saying radical, but something is putting on, 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 on a label, a new emblem that's supposed to represent maybe something that approaches the idea of natural wine. But I agree with you. Uh, I, think, um, I think the general term that I get from most vendors and is natural, which there's no definition. The problem, with, the problem with natural wine um, is, and you, I mean, you've obviously touched on it, um, is that up until now there's been no criteria whatsoever. They just sort of say, I'm natural, which meant everybody, um, a lot of people were taking this as an excuse to kind of sell a whole load of stuff that when they, you know, absolutely, yeah, right. <laughs> just, they're just lazy winemaking, bad winemaking, uh, put natural on the bottle and everybody go, oh, this is wonderful. Um, and, uh, you know, if that's what you want your wine to be, well, um, it's, it, you know, it's, it's, an, um, it's a free world. 
everybody's entitled to their opinion and um, one should step back and respect it. It doesn't mean we all have to do natural wine. And I think there are places um, that are completely into natural wine. Um, I'm very much into organics. I mean, in Willie's we've got, um, I should think something like 70, 80% of the wine list is actually comes from organically grown grapes. And it seems to me, which it, this ties in with my idea of seasons, it ties in with my idea of quality products, mm -hmm. ties in my idea of freshness. If you're, if you're in the vineyard for a whole year working on your, uh, your production of grapes and you're making a huge effort to produce quality grapes, the last thing you want to do when you get out of the end is you know, make a complete mess of it. You want to, you want to make a wonderful product. Um, and so the, the, it's far more important what happens in the, in the vineyard than what happens in, in the cellar. Because basically the cellar is like, you know, the chef being given a wonderful fish. And um, if he's got one of the ingredients, basically, he doesn't have to do a whole lot to, to them for it to be fabulous. Yes. Um, Winemaking can be fairly simple. Well, it's, you're right. You're right on. And most of the comments I get, particularly from small farmers throughout Europe, throughout the world, is, look, my kids are crawling around in that vineyard. I want it to be organic. I don't want pesticides all over their fingertips and put it in their mouth. So that part totally makes sense. And one of my favorite stories is early on in this orange wine uh, uh, phenomenon and natural wine, I was in Brooklyn, and my daughter said, well, we have to go to this wine shop, Dad. You know, like, well, when I was a kid, uh, and we traveled, my father, who was a pharmacist by trade, we went and looked at pharmacies and we took pictures of the signs. That's what we used to do. And so now that because I'm in the wine trade, my kids think I want to go to every wine shop that they've ever been in. So we go to, we go to Brooklyn and it's a natural wine shop, quote unquote. And she says, oh, yeah, let's try this near to Avila. It's from Sicily. I go, great. I didn't even look at the price. And this is probably five years ago. And I grab it and I put it on the counter and she rings it up at $75. And I said, wow, I got to pay $75 for a bottle of wine. I'm used to paying much less than that at the office. But uh, we took it back to the hotel, and it was undrinkable, unpalatable. It, was, it had not turned. It had not had a, gone through anything that looks environmentally that would have damaged it. It just wasn't well made. And like you said, I think it, it's almost laziness to a certain point. And I don't think that you need to have a new palate because something becomes a natural or biodynamic. Uh, there's nothing unnatural about, about the proper additives to wine, like a particularly the natural sulfur or whatever we put in the sulfites. But um, it needs to have an experience. And, and, and I say this all the time, the experience can't be, one, I got it for $3 on the Groupon. That's not a, a wine experience. People are no, not going to appreciate it. it, it, it I, I think that if, if the wine experience that Groupon is giving you is actually stopping people from drinking Coca-Cola, then we're, we're really onto something. And let's face it, I mean, you know, That's a good point. Only, people can only be bombarded by so much stuff at the same time. And a little bit of basic but good wine um, is a, is a far, better, far better thing to do to your body, in my view, than, you know, to can of Coke um, or Red Bull or anything For sure. Like that. um, That's and a good, great point. This, this, so there, there may be a space for all of this, and people can always start off with things, and then as their palates develop, want to move on and discover other things. I mean, you know, I'm always for discovering, and I much rather discover things that are that are affordable and that are fun, that rather than kind of you know have yet another glass of the Chateau Margaux or something. You know, I think that's um, a really good point in that. Experienced wine drinkers are are, are going are to know that we can't find something decent for three dollars, or if you are, do, it's very lucky. And that uh, the the new drinker, the new person coming to the wine side that wants to experiment, doesn't feel like they're risking, you know, three hundred dollars on a bottle of Burgundy to see if they like it. They can get something on Groupon and test it first. I think that's a really really valid point. It's sort of the white Zinfandel of the seventies, where we brought over Scotch drinkers and beer drinkers because they wanted yeah. to taste white Zinfandel because it was so inexpensive. That's so no, well, that's very good point. When, you, when has to let, let, it, let it be. I mean, it won't, I don't think it will snuff out quality wine, wine making. People are making really good wine. Um, there's a following. Um, it, I, I honestly don't think they're going to disappear overnight. And, and there's also, I mean, almost every single wine producing country seems to have um, an incredibly nationalistic approach 
to what's going on. So they all support um, their own wine growers, um, you know, in a, in, a, in a pretty serious manner. Everybody's, New York's probably the, the kind of place where things are a bit more difficult for California. Um, but uh, uh, it was, you know, when I, the last time I was in New York, which goes back a little time, but um, uh, on, the, on the whole, you know, pe people tend to step up to the plate and, and wave the flag and, and they, they're proud of their wines and they, they'll pay for them. Um, that's already, you know, uh, part of the problem solved. I think you're right. Uh, you know, this is coming on our uh, mark. And I, oh, I'm sorry. So to talk about it. We can do it again. Just no wine back. Let's just wipe out some of this and we can keep going. I've got, keep going. Going. <laughs> <laughs> we will do it again. In fact, I want to do it on location at Willie's next time. Uh, yeah. Pushing back on me about traveling, but I, I, I've got to get out of here in the first quarter, the next quarter and, and come to France, put my French to test. We'll, we'll do a lunch with Claudine, la, la Bleu Blanc Rouge. Or Bleu Blanc. Oh, that'd be great. Yeah. Because yeah. I need to meet her too. So, you know, I had, there was one player that I have to tell you, when we were in Napa over the weekend, um, and I didn't even realize, you know, how old she might be, but her name was Joanne Dupuy. Do you remember her? She, oh, wow. she, was the woman who took, who they called, or Stephen called, when he went to Napa to find wines for the Judgment of Paris, they asked Joanne to take him around. So she's sort of, you know, indirectly responsible for the submissions in the Judgment from California because she took them to Stag's Leap and she took them to Chateau Montalena. And this woman, she's 93, uh, and I'll send you the link when it comes out. Fascinating stories. and Like a Napa historian, 1949, she moved there. Uh, and I won't tell you the details because when I got done with the interview, I said, this is more of an inspiration than it is about wine, this woman who landed yeah. herself in this position. As has been this uh, conversation, um, so look forward to seeing you again and That's doing it awesome. again. I, it's great. To, I look forward to meeting you in person. And, and thank you very much. Um, for having me on the show for my pleasure cheers uh, we'll see you soon uh, thank Stay you in touch yeah thank you Thanks. bye